I had a phone call this week and um, I had many, but this person shared with me that their closest confidant and, and friend had betrayed them. And I guess all of us at some point in our life can relate to that. And this man could not understand how it could be possible that someone that you had invested your life in and trusted could in turn betray you in many ways uh, to the point of stripping their bank account financially, everything. And, you know, I, I got to thinking about that because I know I've experienced it, and I'm sure you have. And I thought about it, I thought, the sting of betrayal is, it's felt so much stronger when it's someone close to you. Huh? Mm -hmm. We've all dealt with that, and we've dealt with people who betray us who, who are acquaintances, but when it's someone who's really close, it's, it's a difficult pill to swallow. And it takes a long time to get healed from that. It's, it's not a quick process. It's a process of healing that we have to process. And I think it ties in with what you're saying this morning, Mike, that, that we will suffer and God allows things and it's to bring us through these things. And the greatest known betrayal that we all know of, of course, is, is Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. But if you put that in perspective, he is one of Jesus' closest friends. Mm -hmm. He is one of his confides and... And he's a partner with the Lord. And interesting enough, the Lord chose him. Yes. It wasn't like someone just come into his life. Jesus actually chose this man. And if we go back a step further, it's God who told Jesus to choose him. Because mm -hmm. huh? he said, I only do what I hear my father tell yes. me to do. Yeah. So God chose Judas, the betrayer, to betray God's only son. And God knew it in advance. So God allows these things for a reason. And I, it got me thinking about this topic. You know, and Without Judas' betrayal, there would be no cross. There would be no resurrection. There would be no death. There would not be no answer for our sin. So although we see it as a negative, God sees things through both angles. And often in life, because we're an emotional being, we don't want to see things through God's perspective. But God will allow these things to make us more like his son. And um, those words of Jesus, not my will, but yours be done, Father. You know, it, it gives us a confidence, or gives me a confidence anyway. He has a better plan for me than I do. He has a better plan for you than you do. And although it doesn't always feel that way, not my will, but his be done. And the purpose of the Father in allowing the betrayal can only be interpreted as a lesson for us to conform to a higher purpose. A hard pill to swallow, but it's true. You know, betrayal recalibrates um, or it resets our life um, so the door that was open to the enemy becomes closed. God is the one that recalibrates our life. God is the one that resets our life, as it were. And it may be a broken relationship. It may be what, whatever. It may be a business failure. It may be our best friend has betrayed us. But we have to see that God is in control and he allows this or he stops us going down that path and as it were recalibrates us, takes us back to the beginning again, to zero, to start afresh. Mm -hmm. So we have to see that God has a greater purpose than I had in my life. And I had to spend a good hour on the phone with this person as he poured out his heart, just sharing with him. It's difficult what you're going through, but try and see this from heaven's perspective, not your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the darkest hour, the saying goes, is always before the dawn. Mm -hmm. uh, when life seems to be at its worst, you're just about ready for a breakthrough. <laughs> uh, 
Huh? Mm. That's true. You're right on the verge of a breakthrough. When it gets to its worst, something good is about to happen if you will allow God's plan to take place. Mm. And um, our mind is always at this point under its greatest battle, its greatest struggle. And uh, we have a choice at that point. We either revert back and continue down the same path we were on, or we embrace the new plan God has for us. And um, so often what we do is we turn back to the old ways and we tolerate the enemy again. Instead of embracing God's plan, we embrace the enemy's plan yet again. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And that's all I could keep hearing as this man was speaking to me in my, my ear. As he's speaking to me, it's, I just hear that voice, we're not wrestling against people here. This is an attack of the enemy. This is a spirit. This is a demonic power. And today my word is this. Stop tolerating the Jezebel spirit. It's a hard message. And I have spoken on Jezebel before, but this is going to really open it up. Stop tolerating the Jezebel spirit. I want to say in the last two years, I've had seven different occasions where I've had encounters with the spirit. These are seven different people the enemy has used who have embraced the spirit, this Jezebel controlling, manipulating spirit. Seven different encounters. I won't tell you who those people are because we're not fighting against people. Mm. We have to see it for what it is. Both in the Old Covenant and in the New, we know there's a woman by the name of Jezebel. And I don't want to focus on the woman or where she came from, which is what I've taught on before and her family history, but it, I want to focus on the spirit that is manipulating or controlling that person's life. That's what I want to focus on today. I think as I unpack this, you're going to find it's, it's actually relevant. It's very relevant to each one of us. And um, this is a spirit that is assigned by Satan himself. And it's assigned to destroy whatever life that person can gain influence over. So... Please separate a person from the spirit. But Satan has assigned this spirit to many people's lives. Mm. And I want to deal, just dig into the character of the spirit a little bit so we have an understanding. So my objective is not to look at the person but the spirit and then make an assessment yourself whether your own life is under attack or has been or could be. I've got to say, this is just sharing my heart with you, this is... This has been spiritually the greatest struggle I personally have had in my own life with the Spirit. We all encounter different things in our life. Um, Satan has a horde of angelic beings. He has a horde of demons. They have different assignments. This is the one that I have had the most struggle with personally. And... Um, attacking my life and, and sadly because I haven't discerned it before it's happened. We need the spirit, a, a spirit, or we need a, a mind, if I can put it like that, of discernment. So we, we need to be able to assess the spirit. Otherwise it will destroy. It's got one mission and it's to destroy, to kill, rob and destroy. And so our journey today, if you open your Bible, starts in the book of Revelation uh, and chapter 2. Um, if someone would be as good to read this, chapter 2 and verse 18 through to verse 26, please. Revelation chapter 2. Um, this, of course, is talking to the church. This is Jesus speaking and he is talking to a, to a known church at that time, a church called Paratira, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, it was a good church. They had done a lot of good deeds. They were 
doing the Lord's work, but the Lord had a problem with them. And so if someone can pick it up from verse 18 to 26, please. Chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 18 through to verse 26. If someone would read it, please. To the angels of the church in Teatera write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like... What's that? Burnish... Bronze. 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 I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls her, herself a, a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Teatera, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. That's it. Thank you. So, so when we read this, we, we kind of assume there's someone standing in the pulpit teaching the church, <coughs> but I don't actually see it like that. I think this woman was in the church, she was a believer, but she had great influence over people's lives. She probably went into people's homes, sat in the coffee bars, whatever, and she had influence, I'm bringing it into the, today's mm. modern vernacular, she had influence over other people's lives. So this is a woman that is not necessarily possessed, but it, she could be oppressed with the spirit. In other words, the spirit is constantly following her, constantly speaking into her life, and she's buying into this, and she's trying to impart what she perceives to be wisdom into people in the church's life. And Jesus is saying, you're tolerating this. Now, this is what hit me with this, because I've studied this a lot. What hit me is this word tolerating. How many of us tolerate mm -hmm. this spirit? How many of us accept people having influence into our life that carry the character traits of the Spirit, which I'll dig into today a little bit. So um, if we back up into verse 20 there, Jesus warns the church they have been tolerating Jezebel, that it's okay to commit sexual immorality, um, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And if you recall back in the church council, Jerusalem church council in Acts 15, that was what was discussed, those, those issues about um, abstaining from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality and from things strangled and from blood. And, and you think, well, that's got nothing to do with us today. You'll find out it's got everything to do with us today soon, as I explain this. The meeting had been over whether Gentiles needed to become Jews or whether Jews needed to become Gentiles. And there was this debate going on between them at the time. That's what the purpose of the meeting was. And which, of course, God never required a Jew to become a Gentile and he doesn't require a Gentile to become a Jew. He saves a Jew being a Jew and he saves a Gentile being a Gentile. And um, Jesus reminds the church to keep away from these things. And I've got to be honest, at my age, it hit me only this week how I have tolerated, tolerated this in so many instances in my life, this spirit. I have allowed this spirit to have influence in my life. And um, Jesus said, don't do it. Because there is a warning also for those that are tolerating it. 
sexual immorality and things offered to idols, which basically covers all four things. And see, one defiles us inwardly, which is sexual immorality, of course. The other defiles us outwardly. And the the biblical definition of an idol is this: is is the worshiping of another entity other than the one true God. And that sort of opens up the whole spectrum. The, it's it's a massive subject when you talk about idolatry. And I guess one word to me encompasses idolatry and it's pride. Pride kind of covers everything here because pride means I'm going to exalt my will above God's will. So anything that we put our will above God's word is a form of idolatry. And what we are doing when we don't obey God's word is actually we're worshipping Satan directly. That's a hard pill to swallow. But when... That's what we're doing. We're worshipping Satan. Intentionally or unintentionally. Makes no difference. And for this has been Satan's purpose from the beginning. That I will exalt myself above heavens. Even above God. Why? Because he wanted to be the one to be worshipped. And often when we talk about worship, we think it's singing songs or what. But it's not. It's actually about our life. It's our life. How do we conduct our life? Our lifestyle is, is worship. We don't need to sing songs to worship God. It's what comes out of our mouth. Even our thought life, like our sister said last week, it, it's all of that is a form of worship to God, or the devil for that matter. And the reason the church council had said we are not to partake of those four things was it defiled the relationship between God and our fellow brethren. And our fellow brethren. And um, that obviously then disqualifies me from serving the Lord. The Jezebel spirit assigned is to defile us in order to disqualify us. That's the job of the Jezebel spirit. To disqualify us from serving the Lord. To make us ineffective as it were. And here's the, here's the problem with the spirit as I see it. We don't want to confront the spirit. I know in my life I haven't wanted... To, I mean, I have to be pushed to the max before I'll confront. I am not... I'm not you may think, oh, you're, you're quite firm or, or hard. And I grew up in a family where both my parents were quite willing to speak up. But I'm actually... I will withdraw like a crab under a rock until I'm pushed to the limit. You may be like that too. But th this is the problem. We don't want to confront the spirit. Not, I'm not talking about a person. Sometimes you have to confront a person who's got the spirit. But we don't want to confront this. So what we do, we run into our bedroom and we pray against it. And it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. If there's something you're afraid of, or someone, especially someone you're afraid of, to confront, because you know they'll either chew you out, attack you, or reject you, then there's a very big possibility that person has a Jezebel spirit influencing their life. Don't tell me, but do you have anyone like that in your life? Is there someone you're afraid to confront? Because you know they will either attack you, reject you, when I even share this, I shake, I tremble, because it, it, this has been a difficult path for me in confronting the spirit over life. This was the case at the church of Tyratira. It wasn't that there was like sex rolling in the aisles and that in the church. No, no, no. The, the, there was a knowledge of this stuff going on, and the people were afraid to say anything. You ever been in a church like that? I have. Actually, many, where where the pastor knows or the eldership knows what's going on with some of the members, and maybe they're living together for two or three years or more, and the pastor is afraid to stand on the truth and go and try and lovingly help this person and confront it and expose the sin, because once sin is exposed, it loses its power. 
And we see that right through the church today in the world, that problem. Elijah, the mighty man of valor, this, this mighty man of God, run from Jezebel, which gives us an indication how powerful, if there's levels of power in the demonic realm, and I believe there is, how powerful the spirit is. A Jezebel spirit cannot operate without an Ahab. <laughs> it cannot operate without an Ahab. Okay, so I know where I fit into those two. <laughs> and Ahab is one that tolerates this control and tolerates this manipulation and cows away into a corner and allows a person to influence your life. That's what an Ahab is. Interesting, I got this just as I was leaving this morning. I know this is just a long shot. It could be me putting numbers together. Ahab was the seventh king of Israel. He resided for 21 years as king. What year are we in now? 2107. Uh, sorry, 2017. So I don't know if any of those numbers got any to do with God's into numbers. and whether, uh, It just came to me this morning. He resided 21 years. He was the seventh king of Israel. I wonder if this year is the year that God is dealing with the spirit in the church. This Ahab spirit that has allowed sin in the church, that has allowed corruption, that has tolerated these very things, sexual sin and etc., etc., idolatry in the church. I wonder if this is... It's only a long shot. Just watch it. Let's see what happens this year. And um, I guess I have to qualify what I'm teaching today before we point the fingers at anyone. Each one of us at some time have controlled somebody. Uh, well, I sure have. I don't know about you, but I, there, there's been times, um, especially our children... Sometimes we, we do. And controlling others and we've allowed ourselves to be controlled also. And that's really where I want to focus in on today. Are you allowing the spirit to control your life? Are you allowing it to influence your life so much that you can't progress and fulfill what God has for you? See, I found this really interesting in studying out the life of Ahab. If we think of kings in the Old Covenant who conquered lands, who conquered domain, you automatically think of David as this great king, the great conqueror. And yet David is behind Ahab in this. Ahab conquered more than what David did in the Bible. There is only one king that conquered more than Ahab. And it's Solomon. Solomon first, Ahab second. And I find that really interesting because what it tells me is you can be a great conqueror in life. You can, you can, you can have conquest over many things. You can build great churches. You can have a church of 50,000 people. And seemingly you've succeeded. And yet you are still controlled by this spirit. The spirit still has conquered you. I found that really, really mm. interesting. Huh? The Jezebel spirit can operate in a woman or a man. There's no gender specific in this. And many instances in the Bible, we see a man with a spirit, and I'll give you one off the cuff, and that's Herod the Great. I think there's five Herods in the Bible, so let's not get them all mixed up. Herod the Great was around at the time Jesus was born. And, of, of course, he said to the wise men, when they were looking for Jesus, he said, when you find him, come back and tell me. Because if, if you find him and you've told me, I'll also come and worship him. Remember the two he's had on the signboard? Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't at all in Herod's mind. He wanted to kill Jesus. That was his whole purpose. That's a Jezebel spirit. It's, it, 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 its purpose is ultimately is to destroy. And it will manipulate and do anything to achieve its results. And, um, you know, Herod, interesting, once again, I studied him out a little bit this week just so I could give a wee few references to him. He was an interesting character who probably conquered a lot more than what most kings did. 
And of course the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is one of his great successes. Most people don't know that. But it was King Herod the Great that actually built the Wailing Wall. Mm. And, and there's lots of other things throughout the world that still stand today that he um, brought around. And Josephus, a story, and he said about Herod, he said, in killing his, his favorite wife, Shortly after he had slaughtered her, he was very sorry for what he did. That's what Josephus said in his writings. And I thought, well, what a big man. He was sorry he killed his wife. But the thing was, with Herod the Great, he killed all his wives. And he killed anyone who got in his way. And that's what the Spirit wants to do, is just, just destroy you and anyone else. That's its ultimate purpose, is to destroy. Herod just a few days, I think five days, history tells us, before he died, Herod the Great, killed his own favorite son. Knew he was going to die himself, so he kills his own son because he doesn't want his son to get any glory. So he kills his own son. This is a Jezebel spirit. In the natural, you think, how could that be possible? Well, Here's a very good example of it. There are eight character traits to this spirit, this Jezebel spirit, and I'll just flick through them real quickly. Insecurity. The person is very insecure. Manipulation. They're very manipulative. Jealousy. They are very, very jealous. They carry a spirit of pride with them all the time. It comes out in their conversation. They use intimidation, rejection, arrogance, control. Now, just going back to this rejection, um, this is a biggie because the, the, the person who's carrying the spirit has been rejected themselves at some time. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about their parent because automatically, you know, it was my mother or father rejected them. We all want to do that at times. Come on. But it's not necessarily that. It's I have rejected God. That's where the spirit of rejection enters. When we reject God. You know, we have to come to a point when we harden up a bit, as our brother Bruce says, and get over our past. We cannot keep using our past as a scapegoat. How am I doing with God? Am I rejecting God? Because that's the entry point for that spirit. So um, there are four effects this spirit has, this Jezebel spirit, that will bring into your life. These are the four effects you're going to feel on the receiving end of the spirit. And um, if you are feeling these, it is possible that the spirit is attacking you. Um, number one, fear. Whenever you see this person's name appear on your emails, do you think, oh no, I don't want to open that. When your phone goes and they talk, you go, does that in your gut? You just don't want to have this conversation. When you see them on the street, you want to turn the other way. That. In First Kings chapter 19, if you'll turn there, and someone will read this to save me having to open my Bible. First, the story we all know um, about Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, reading from verses 1 to 8. And of course, Elijah has just had this amazing success on Mount Carmel, I think it was, where he takes out all of Jezebel's false prophets um, back in chapter 18. And, and he's just had this very successful day killing God's enemies, all 450 prophets of Baal, and I think there was 400 prophets of Esther, that Elijah has removed and now he's hiding and he wants to die and he's in fear of this woman's words and I don't say that to be chauvinistic but if someone could read this starting from verse 1 through to verse 8 please and I have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me 
and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, is it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. And he arose, and he did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights mm. into horror, horror of the mount of God. Thank you. You know, you've read that many times too, I know, and... and, and Every time I read it, I think, here is this great man of God. Oh, if I was like that. Oh, if I could call down fire and, and you know, 800 plus false prophets destroyed. And yet, a woman? You say, well, she had authority because she's the king's wife. Well, all of those prophets had authority. Any one of them could have killed him. And usually men have more strength in the natural than a lady. And yet, he was afraid. You ever get fearful over addressing someone? And you think it's better not to say anything? Especially pastors. Especially pastors. Maybe a family member. Maybe... A supposed friend. I'm not suggesting you should confront them. I'm just saying, do you do you feel that in your stomach? Is going, no, I, I don't want to do that. No, 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 because no. you know what's going to come. And where we go wrong, I believe, is this. This is what the Holy Spirit showed me this week. We forget to take authority at the beginning of the day over Satan. The first thing in the morning, the first thing we should do we should take authority over the enemy. Mm. And we walk straight in to a battle with the enemy, which we're going to lose because the truth is you've opened yourself up to him. The Bible says submit to God, number one. Resist the devil, number two. And he will flee, number three. Mm. In that order, submit to God. We need to start our day by submitting to God. Mm. And then resisting the devil. Mm. If you have fear, it's a spirit. I think it was Timothy that said, God has not given us, or Paul to Timothy, a spirit of fear. But a power of love. Mm. And a sound mind. Fear only has power because it's tolerated. As a matter of fact, I think our brother shared, shared some weeks ago with me, um, you know, that, that Jesus won at the cross everything. He, he, he destroyed the works of the devil, and that's so true, he did. But we give him power when we allow these things into our life, when we tolerate these things. The Jezebel spirit's got its roots in insecurity always. If you study it yourself, you'll find that Jezebel herself in the Old Covenant was the daughter of, a, of a, a prominent king, I think, at the time. And she was a princess, a Syrophesian princess from memory. And Her father was a manipulator. He was an evil man, and he wanted to conquer the land, where, uh, land of Israel. That was his purpose. So basically, he set up his daughter with Ahab. That was his objective. 
really, really manipulate. In other words, he'll reject his daughter to get his own way. He manipulated to get his own way. And um, people with this spirit have been so wounded, they have to control. They have to control everyone and everything. Not just people, but everything. So they don't feel rejection. I will reject you first so you can't reject me. I will stop this marriage before you stop it. I will hurt you so you can't hurt me because if I hurt you, I've got the upper hand. It's a Jezebel spirit. They'll reject others, even family members, because they are afraid themselves of rejection. Often they know they've done wrong, the person. So they will reject in order to gain power over that person, to hurt that person. And ultimately what happens is the family will reject the person with the Jezebel spirit. It'll take time, but that's what will happen. You have to, to protect yourself. And I've seen this and I'm watching it now in Christian families, people I know with children, where the children are rejecting their parent. Because the parent, one of them has the spirit. It's sad. The single most common way the spirit enters a believer's life is through a family member or a friend. The single way it gets into your life is through a family member or a friend. Why? Because those have greater influence over you than someone out there who you can just shake off. It's very difficult with family. I don't want to go into personal details, but we all know this. It's a lot more difficult when it's your own family to cut ties with that person, to shake that person off. It's a lot more difficult. Because your heart is always going out to them to want to see change. Your heart is always there in your prayer life and in every way to see. You, you, you hold on to hope even without hope that things are going to change. You know what I'm talking about, anyone? But remember something, and this is a reality we all have to come to. This spirit hates you, hates you. And it wants to destroy you. It's a spirit. Mm -hmm. And Saul was David's close confider's friend. But Saul ended up wanting to kill David and had many attempts at it, as you know. Absalom, David's son, the same. Absalom wanted to kill his father. Mm -hmm. Why? To take control of the kingdom. Jezebel's spirit. And then if we go further, we can go on to Mephibosheth, which is the grandson of David, I believe. It's, it's Jonathan's boy. Mm. Even after Saul and Jonathan are killed, God removes them. Mephibosheth hates David in his heart. And he wants to destroy David. Study it out sometime. That's family family. Psalm 41 is a psalm of David that speaks about the pain he went through when his best friend betrayed him. Now I can't even pronounce his best friend's name but it starts with A. That's all I can remember. And this guy that handled everything, you know, the finance of the kingdom, the lot, who followed David everywhere ends up turning on David and betraying him. And later Jesus himself, before his crucifixion, uses part of the psalm and he quotes it. And I'll read it to you. This is the heart of our Lord and, he, and he's pouring out the psalm that David wrote. And he's saying in verse 9 of Psalm 41, he said, My own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, has lifted up his heel against me. 
I know this is not a shouting topic, but this is, by the end of this, I believe it's really going to help each one of us. And look what the Message Bible says. I wrote this down. Psalm, in Psalm 55, which is another, David once again is pouring his heart out about this very issue. Psalm 55 and verse 20 to 21. In the Message Bible. And David says, and this is my best friend. And he's betrayed his best friend meaning himself. His life betrayed his word. All my life I've been charmed by his speech, never dreaming he would turn on me. I come back to my phone call this week. It's those that we're closest to can cause the most hurt and pain. Jesus was close to Judas Iscariot. It was one of his close friends. Handpicked. We're talking about the effects today of a Jezebel spirit that can bring upon your life. And the first effect I brought is fear. And the second effect today is isolation. Elijah, run and hid out. When you want to get away from everything and everyone, I don't know about you, but I've planned my exit many times. Melba Sounds has always been a good place for me. No one's around, just head for the mountains. Quite happy to live there, even on my own. And, you know, I, we need to make the difference here between solitude and isolation. Isolation is dangerous. Solitude is totally different, because isolation means I'm going away with myself and I don't want anyone or anything around me. Solitude means I'm going away with God. We need solitude every day of our life. But not isolation. Elijah ran and he hid out where he couldn't be found. Even his very closest friend, he left him a day away that he didn't know where he was. So... Solitude is getting alone with God, but isolation is getting alone with you. And I've got to say, not one of us are that good that we should be getting alone with ourselves. Because <laughs> we're just going to screw ourselves up. <laughs> we need to get alone with God so we can hear what he's got to say, so we don't screw ourselves up. <laughs> huh? The third effect the Spirit can bring upon our life is exhaustion. I... I can so relate to this. I'm not just talking about being tired from working hard. This exhaustion, even when you just can't seem to, it doesn't matter how much rest you have, you can't seem to get better. And 1 Kings 19 tells us Elijah went, he sat down under a broom tree, and he fell asleep. And the message says, the message Bible says he collapsed under the broom tree. And Elijah wanted to give up. Notice what he says. I just want to die. I just want to die. Now this is where it gets a little bit heavier. Because I've been here. I don't know about you. I've been here. You ever felt like that? I'd far rather be there than here. You ever been so exhausted with problems bombarding your mind? You wanted to give up. Mm. It's more than likely a Jezebel spirit. It's more than likely a Jezebel spirit. Mm. Because you see, it's not up to us when the curtain is drawn. It's up to God. Mm. And as long as we tolerate the spirit operating through someone else, it will affect your life. If you can't sleep well, there's a possibility. It's a Jezebel spirit. God never designed man to take sleeping pills. I'm going to say that. If we're taking sleeping pills, there's something wrong. We need to find out what it is. We're meant to lay our head on the pillow and be at peace. And snore. And snore. <laughs> 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 I 
there's a reason why, and I think we need... You say, well, what's that got to do with this? It's got a lot to do with it. Elijah collapsed and fell asleep. He was absolutely exhausted. In other words, when he got out of the sphere of influence of this woman, it no longer had influence on him, and he just... Up until then, he was tense, he was wound up, he was on guard. Number four is depression, and this is the last one, and maybe the hardest pill to swallow of all. Elijah came and he sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he may die. Certainly a major sign of depression. And this prayer to die is common in the Bible especially in the Old Covenant, it's actually really, really common. Moses prayed that he might die. Kill me to God. Jeremiah many times prayed, Cursed be the day that I was born. In other words, I don't want to be alive. And Jonah, of course, chapter 4, he says, Take my life from me. I don't want it no more, God. And thoughts of suicide... And I wish our brother was here this morning because he deals a lot with this. A clearer evidence of a Jezebel spirit operating. I'll say it again because this has not been dealt with well in the church or in the public sector. Thoughts of suicide are a spirit. A spirit that is attacking someone's mind so vehemently. They're so exhausted, so worn out with life. They want to die. When our conversation is not authorized by God, rather it's speaking destruction, it's usually a sign of a Jezebel spirit operating. You know, those thoughts of quitting. I, I have a testimony in this, and one Sunday I'm going to share it, because you'd be horrified in my own life. I don't mean recently. This is going back. Those thoughts that I just, I don't want to be here anymore. Life's too hard. Life's hard, we know that. But when you get to the point that you see no value in yourself being here, that's a spirit attacking you. Because you are valuable. You are precious to God. He's placed you here for a reason. Amen. And it may not be the reason you know of at this time. And people who operate with the spirit manipulate with guilt. In other words, our example... You say something, and they'll come back to you. You're rejecting me, just like everyone else rejects me. That's manipulation. These people carry a victim mentality. The world owes me. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, once again, Jesus warns, and this really, really helped me yesterday. I've got to be honest. I hope it helps you the same. Jesus warns, of these strange prolonged sicknesses and symptoms that come because of entertaining the spirit. Symptoms that when you go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, look, we don't actually know what's causing that. It's not showing on our graphs. These type of symptoms are spiritual. In verse 22 of that chapter, he said, Indeed, I'll cast her, Jezebel, into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent. You felt like you'd been in the tribulation before? Hello? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spirit. It's a spirit trying to get into your life. And some of that responsibility has to come back on to you and to me for entertaining it. Okay, so the physical always becomes affected because of the spiritual. The physical and the spiritual are actually connected. So the physical will manifest what's happening in the spiritual. An individual or a church will suffer and I say a church can suffer, the whole church can suffer at the hands of a pastor entertaining the spirit in the church. 
or an elder or a leader. Everyone in the church can be affected by it. And then you see this other symptom, which is great tribulation, and I interpret that to be life's not going good. Really bad. I mean, life's hard, we know that. But life should be. You wake up every day and say, praise the Lord, this is a new day. Awesome. I'm alive. I can do something today for God. This Jezebel spirit will try to steal your peace, your joy, and your confidence mm. until you have none of those left. Ten years in my own life, prolonged sickness. Ten years of it in the past. Multiple heart events to the point of death. And looking back now, each time I got ill and rushed into hospital or stopped breathing or whatever it was, I can point you exactly to the event that had happened within a short space of time prior. And it was always engaging with the Spirit each time. Mm. Always. I can pinpoint it. Mm. The Spirit's ultimate goal is to destroy our life. So what's the solution? And this is in closing. Repent. <laughs> we come back to that. Repent for allowing, for tolerating this person in your life having influence over you. Mm. Repent for not confronting the situation sooner. Mm. Number two, remove the person from having any influence over you at all. No, you say a family member, it doesn't matter. You say that's too hard, that's anti-God, that's not loving. Listen, we've got to get over this whole family thing. Jesus said, who is my mother, who is my brother, who is my father? Those that do the will of my father. We've got to get over this nandy-pandy view of family and start to realize Satan will work through our family as much as he'll work through the whomever. Yes, we are to love our family. But sometimes love has to be tough, and I'm quoting James Dobson here. Sometimes love, love has to draw a line in the sand and say enough. Jesus said, the reason you're like this is because you've tolerated this. You cannot remain friends with someone who won't be teachable, who won't be humble. Because that person will continue to affect your life negatively. This is... Uh, this is not just me preaching from a pulpit. This is something I personally have had to deal with. And I'll tell you, it's a painful journey. It's a painful road. Some of you will know that already. In closing, I want to give an example of what can happen when you remove the spirit. And I'll take it away from me personally to my ministry in the Philippines that for many, many, many years we struggled. Only God knows. And it was only God who provided the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that heard the gospel or were fed or whatever. But the financial struggles I carried to myself, I never let a pastor know. I never let a church know. And I would come back here and I would work for six to eight weeks when I meant to be with my family to provide money to support the ministry. You say that's contrary to the Bible. Well, that's what I did. We make mistakes. What I did is I moved to another island for the sole purpose of ministering or reaching out to foreign people that were living there who were financially well off. Because in my mind, I had rationalized that these people can help our need. And I was successful at it. And these people started to help until I felt an obligation by one in particular because they gave so much money on a regular basis. And in order to reward this person for what they are doing and have done, I allowed them to come on to our board of directors. In other words, it's the same as a church, like a deacon board. And this person's life was not qualified 
to be on their board of directors. Instead of things improving, things deteriorated more and more. Until I remove that person after two or three years. It was within two or three weeks of that removal. Things turned. And I'm talking a marked turn. One person gave $70,000. Interesting, the number seven. Hmm. It was like God disqualifying what I'd done. This is right. 70000 goes a long way in an orphanage. And I realized then, the only way to not be affected by the spirit is don't tolerate it. Don't try and work things out in your head, whether you're the mother, the father, the brother, the sister. The only way to not be affected is don't tolerate it until there is full repentance in that person's life. So here we are. At the end of this, is there someone in your life, someone in my life, that always tries to manipulate you? Someone who tries to intimidate you, control you? Someone who's jealous? Someone who is proud and arrogant? Someone who wants to control? Is the jealousy seen by an attitude of the world owes me? I've worked hard for this. This is mine. It's not fair. And this person did that to me. Do you feel afraid of that person? Do you feel exhausted with life at times that you just want to give up? Do you want to isolate yourself? Do you feel depression? Hmm? Have you considered ending it all? Or asking God to end it? then it's time today to receive salvation. Salvation meaning freedom from the Spirit. Freedom from it. Mm. It's time today that we draw a line in the sand and say, no more. I will not tolerate any more. This person no longer will have an influence over my decisions. This is a new day. Today is a new day. Huh? Jesus said, the thief cometh to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's the character of the Spirit. Father, we humbly come before you. We know in ourselves we cannot do anything other than proclaim your word that you've given us. And today, I take authority in the name of Jesus. Amen, Jesus. Over the influence of the Spirit. Amen. Be it in our mother, our father, our sisters, our brothers, our aunts, our uncles, our friends, even our bosses, our pastors, whomever it may be. Our ex-partners whomever that may be. I take authority in the name of Jesus and I proclaim and declare you are defeated by the blood of Jesus. We will not tolerate you because that is the words of our Savior Jesus. We will not tolerate and allow you to continue to influence us, to affect us. And Father, we pray for a speedy recovery if it is a family member and I also ask that you withdraw the pain that we would have to continue to go through, Lord, as we watch the demise of our family member. Lord, help us not to carry that, but to cast our care upon you. Amen. For you promised you care for us. Amen. I pray today for freedom, Father. A fresh start for some of us. In Jesus' name, that we no longer carry guilt, that we could have done it this way or that way or better or worse or whatever. But we know that you are in control and that you've been trying to show us for some time your will and your purpose. And we've tried to fix it in our strength rather than hand it over to you to fix it for us. We give it over to you. We bring it to the foot of the cross. Mm. 
in the name of our Savior. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you praise that you've given us authority. Mm. Authority mm. to cast down the enemy. Mm. Thank you for your precious blood, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen.